Hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. On entering the house, the wise men saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all of the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Kalat grew up in Baghdad, Iraq. She received an accredited university degree and married the love of her life. As a Sunni Muslim, she witnessed and experienced hatred and violence between extremists in both the Sunni and Shiite sects. Although she and her family were never involved in the violence, they lived amidst kidnapping, torture, and murder for most of their lives. Even in the supposed safety of a doctor's office, Kalat feared for her safety. When she was seven months pregnant, she went to the doctor for a routine examination, but she was induced inappropriately in an attempt to kill her child. She and her husband also received numerous death threats. They eventually fled to Syria, where she gave birth to a baby boy. However, they were not authorized to work in Syria, so she made the tough decision to return to the danger in Iraq. There, she could work and send money back to her husband in Syria until her family was granted refugee status and received the news that they would be resettled to the United States. This story is found on the Refugee Services of Texas's website, which has a few stories of some of the refugees who have been resettled through your agency. The similarities between Kalat's story and Mary and Joseph's story in our scripture passage today are hard to ignore. In both cases, a foreign nation served as a place of refuge. In both cases, the main character is escaping a violent country. In both cases, the life of a small child is in immediate danger. You know, I've been hearing a whole lot lately about how Jesus, you know, was a refugee in response to what many, including our own governor here in Texas, have said regarding our nation's commitment in bringing more refugees in, particularly from Syria. Usually, when Jesus' refugee status is brought up, however, people mention Bethlehem and Mary and Joseph not finding hospitality in an inn. But I think it's this story, the slaughter of the innocents by King Herod, that illuminates Jesus' family's solidarity with refugees today. The poet Orson Shire offers another perspective in her poem entitled Home, which I'll read an excerpt here. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten or pitied. I want to go home. But home is in the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs, 
to leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hunger, beg. Forget pride, your survival is more important. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. I cannot unhear this poem. I can't forget it when I read our scripture passage today. I can't forget it when I see reports that children are fleeing to Texas from inescapable violence and forced gang integration in Central America again. I can't forget it when I consider the multitudes of people who are forced to put their children in boats because the water of the Mediterranean Sea is more safe than their homeland in Syria. I can't forget this poem. So there's no reason given in our scripture passage today that explains Herod's drastic response to the wise men taking another road home. But reading back, we see that when Herod hears of the news of Christ's birth in Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. Anxiety is pernicious, and it spreads quickly like yeast through bread. Fear of Jesus, presumably, led to Herod slaughtering innocents. Just like fear of the picture that Hitler's Third Reich painted of Jews led to the Hague Holocaust. Just like fear of all Asian people because of Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor led us as a nation to place them in concentration camps. Just like fear of darker skin colors and our own sordid past with enslaving other people have led to our painful ongoing conflict over race in our country. And just like fear of the unknown today has led us into wars and currently deadlocks our politics, especially in regards to our nation's capability to be hospitable. Fear it creeps into our communities and it gets in the way of our ability to love and live as Christ would have us do. For Mary and Joseph, I wonder what their fear was like that led them to flee their homeland in Egypt. What was it like for a Jewish family to flee into the very country they were taught repeatedly had enslaved them so many years ago? Our scripture passage contains a very interesting irony. That the very country that provided shelter to Jesus' family was the country that had its own account of infant genocide. In the first chapter of the book of Exodus, Pharaoh, fearful of the growing number of Hebrew people in his territory, commanded the Egyptians to throw into the Nile every Hebrew boy, but let every girl live. Herod, in his own fear, massacred all of the children up to age two in and around Bethlehem. Can you imagine? I think that the Syrian people today actually can imagine what this Herodian genocide was like. You see, half of Syria's pre-Civil War population of 2012, more than 11 million people, have been killed or forced to flee their homes. I want to go home, but home is in the mouth of a shark. More than 3,200 people this year have perished in attempted sea crossings to Europe. I want to go home, but home is in the mouth the shark. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. I want to go home, but home is in the mouth of a shark. I can't imagine the terror, despair, and trauma in the life of a Syrian or Iraqi refugee today, but I know that Jesus can. Jesus and his family lived it. They were refugees. Jesus and his family were border-crossing people, and in their deepest need, Egypt, of all places, became refuge for Jesus and his family. Now, talking about this is inconvenient, I know, and it's uncomfortable, and it bothers us. It bothers me. May we never know what it's like to be a refugee. The abundance of peace and freedom that we enjoy in this country today is incredible. 
when placed in stark contrast with the rest of the world. But what do we do with this peace and freedom? Some of us want to shut the door on the outside world in order to preserve what we have, in order to protect our peace and freedom. Others want to participate in the myth of redemptive violence that tells us that we can go to war to solve our, all of the world's problems, to use the tool of violence to destroy a force that we think is threatening our peace and freedom. And others, myself included sometimes, just want to close our eyes and ears and let the problem sort itself out. And then there are incredible people, people who want to go wide-eyed into the dangerous places where there is deep need, others who want to open their homes to strangers they have never met, others who want to offer from their own resources in order to support efforts that save the lives of people they will never meet. There are incredible people who want to be Egypt for the stranger in need, like Egypt was a place of refuge for Emmanuel. God with us. When I consider these incredible people, I can't help but look at myself. Because when I look at my ministry and I examine what my role is here, I find it lacking. You know, I really begin to wonder how I could ever possibly be Egypt. How I could be Egypt for, say, the refugee of LGBTQ discrimination. Or how I could ever be a place of refuge for the asylum seeker who just wants to feel safe walking home tonight in our own neighborhood here in Oak Lawn. I begin to wonder how I could ever be shelter for the huge amount of homeless teenagers kicked out of their home because they are gay or transgender or simply are a part of a family who is too poor to remain in a home. I begin to wonder how I could ever offer assistance to someone who is hungry or peace to someone who is distraught because I'm reminded of how in the past two years that I've worked here, I have yet to serve at Gail's Kitchen Angels. I'm reminded that I have failed repeatedly to respond when God has presented me with an opportunity to bless others. I'm reminded that I am no paragon of virtue whatsoever, and it's solely by the grace of God that I am enabled to become the hands and feet of Jesus Christ for the neighbor in need. So I'm reminded of all of my inadequacies, and I'm reminded of all the things that I have not done, and I'm presented with two options. I could feel guilty and remain paralyzed, or I could do something about it. Oklahoma United Methodist Church, I wonder how we could be Egypt for our neighborhood. How can we be Egypt for the homosexual or transgender teen? How can we be Egypt for the homeless in our midst? Literally, in our midst, in the worship space here today. How can we be Egypt for each other when we're hurting, afraid, or angry? How can we be Egypt for those people who have been harmed by us by association as we are a part of the United Methodist Church? How can we be Egypt for the refugees who are heading to Dallas right now? See, as United Methodist Church, we are called to make disciples for the transformation of the world. But how are we doing that as a church here? See, I think, having said all this, we can be proud of what we've done so far. Whether it's helping with providing Thanksgiving meals, whether it's giving emergency grocery assistance to someone in need or providing a longer term nutrition assistance, or a community meal every Sunday afternoon of the year, 52 times a year, or helping out with ba Dallas Bethlehem Center like we did this Christmas. But I also think that we can do more. Oakland, I think we must do more. We can be Egypt in our neighborhood. We can become involved with the current movement that is calling right now for safety on the streets, with more lights, more cops on the corner, so that people can walk home feeling safe. We can be Egypt for the LGBTQ community by being a church that seeks to make its position on reconciliation and inclusion of all of God's people known clearly to our denomination by voting to become members of the Reconciling Ministries Network. And we can become individual members of the Reconciling Ministries Network as well. We can be Egypt for homeless teenagers with nowhere to go. 
We can get started in our effort right now to work toward a partnership with other organizations in the area in order to open up a homeless shelter for LGBTQ youth in our neighborhood. And we can be Egypt for the refugee family of the 21st century by partnering with organizations like Refugee Services in Texas, which is located right here in Dallas. We can offer financial assistance, we can welcome new families as they arrive at the airport, we can walk alongside them as they transition to life here in a foreign country to them, we can help furnish an empty apartment for them. We can live into our mandate as Christians to not oppress or mistreat foreigners, for we were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. We can help refugees make a home here. Brothers, sisters, this is how we show hospitality to those angels whom we have not yet met. Join with us. Help us move forward. In the hospitality center, there is a little tower, and in that tower is sheets of salmon-colored paper, and on that sheet of paper is a three-year framework of how we are seeking to become good neighbors with the neighborhood around us. Some dreams and some hopes are on this sheet of paper. Look over it. Share with us how you would like to be involved. There is a passage in Jeremiah, chapter 31, that's quoted in our scripture for today. Now, we only get to hear the first part of Jeremiah 31, 31 in the Matthew reading, about weeping at Ramah and Rachel's inconsolation. But what we don't hear in Matthew is the other half of this Jeremiah passage. Starting with verse 16. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, says the Lord. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, says the Lord. Your children shall come back to their own country. In the midst of despair, violence, fear, and hatred, God always offers us hope. There is a reward for your work, says the Lord. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There's such great need in the world, brothers and sisters. But Jeremiah reminds us that there is a reward for our work. We can do our part to heal, reconcile, and make new. This is how we build the kingdom of God. This is how we can be Egypt for those who are in peril. This is how we let love continue. Amen.